गुड मॉर्निंग एट द ऑन सेट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक डॉक्टर बंसी साबू एंड हिज टीम द होल ऑर्गेनाइजिंग टीम फॉर गिविंग दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी इट्स ऑलवेज अ प्लेजर टू बी अ पार्ट ऑफ यू डी एफ सिम्पोजियम एंड एज डॉक्टर अल्पना सेट इट्स प्योरली ए क्लिनिकल सिम्पोजियम विच इज़ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इन डे टू डे क्लिनिकल प्रैक्टिस इज देयर अ प्लेस फॉर सल्फन एलुरिया इन द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ टाइप टू डायबिटीज इज इट रियली अ डिबेटेबल क्वेश्चन I'm sure almost all of us are using it in day-to-day -day practice. Maybe we start and we end the day with sulfonylureas. And if you see this data, this uh, categorically says that of the 77 million Indians with diabetes, almost 36 percent are on sulfonylureas. So it's a huge, huge uh, prescription which we are using it very, very safely. And in a couple, uh, few years down the line, we'll be celebrating 100 years of sulfonylurea. 1956, tolbutamide was started up, and it's 2056. It's going to be 100 years. And in this presentation, we are going to have pathophysiology of diabetes and how the sulfonylurea has fit into it, unique mechanism and efficacy, efficacy, safety and durability, then cardiovascular safety, pleiotropic benefits, ischemic preconditioning. conclusions guidelines and recommendations let me tell you at this uh, point of time when we were doing our post graduation we had three drugs in our basket in the medical colleges i'm talking about nair medical college nair hospital sulfonylureas metformin and insulin and insulin were both bovine and porcine and human insulin and at that particular time in 1995 96 there was a very landmark trial which was published that is called as uk pds and i tell you there is no presentation in diabetes where you don't quote a uk pds data and you know what uk pds used they used drugs like chlorpropamide and glibenclamide then they used metformin and they used th uh, insulin and they used as monotherapy in the beginning there were three arms one arm was on sulfonylurea the other arm was on metformin the other arm was on insulin and let me tell you we have phenomenal results of uk pds even the legacy effects which we talk about in uk pds so you can understand what sulfonylurea means to us in our clinical practice the only thing is in recent time in last one decade we have been carried away with the newer drugs and we when we talk about the newer drugs we criticize the older ones that is how it is so we need to understand how we can actually use these drugs very very safely and we all are very very confident in using sulfonylureas if you ask me uh, any doctor anywhere whether it is a periphery a rural area or a village they start someone on a sulfonylurea very very e easily and nothing goes wrong most of them are doing pretty good so this is the ominous octet pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes which we have been seeing since pretty long time the same story the important thing is there are a lot of places where sulfonylurea fits in it fits in at the level of beta cells where it releases insulin and it fits into the level of alpha cells where it also decreases glucagon by the paracrine effect of insulin whenever there is a release of insulin from the uh, beta cells the paracrine effect actually suppresses the glucagon release from the islets then at the level of brain again there is a good mechanism if you see the uh, pathogenesis the sulfonylurea 1 receptor sur1 receptors which is there at the level of beta cells are also present in the brain and probably they have a very very direct effect from the uh, neurotransmitters that actually mediates the release of uh, insulin from the beta cells if you see type 1 diabetes gad antibodies you know gad antibodies how they actually cause type 1 diabetes gad is an enzyme which acts at gabapentinergic uh, hormone which are released at the level of neurotransmitters and these neurotransmitters are inhibitory neurotransmitters so when there is a gad antibodies this inhibitory transmitters doesn't act and what it happens is it uh, actually causes the direct lysis of the beta cells and that is how you have type 1 diabetes so similar is the mechanism the neural mechanism how actually sulfonylureas even help there so you have multiple sites and there are extra pancreatic benefits there are a lot of data in the literature where it suggests there are extra pancreatic benefits of even sulfonylureas these are the sulfonylureas sorry i'm sorry sulfonylureas are recommended second line agents after metformin for the treatment of type 2 diabetes but let me tell you there are indication as a first line drug of sulfonylurea can anyone say the first line indication of sulfonylurea in a diabetic patients 
is MODI, M-O-D-Y. MODI patients, they only do, they only require a sulfonylurea. A very small dose of sulfonylurea, they do excellently. There are good literatures even of sulfonylurea uses in pregnancy. If you see the O. Langer study, which was published way back in 2000 in NEGM, they used, he used actually glibenclamide, low dose glibenclamide very effectively in patients with pregnancy and diabetes, even in gestational diabetes. And there is a very good published data of almost 700 patients where he showed there was no complications with low dose of glibenclamide. And a lot of gynecologists started using after that. And recently, even a lot of people are using uh, where the insulin is not been easy to actually use and monitor uh, blood sugar. So sulfonylureas are mostly the second line after metformin on the most of the guidelines. This is what is the mechanism. Sorry, can, can I use the pointer on the laptop? This is the mechanism of action. This is the sulfonylurea receptor at the level of beta cells, which is called as SUR1 subtype where this uh, sulfonylurea binds and it closes one second yep so it, this is where it acts sur1 and after there is a closure of this potassium channels the moment this potassium channels are closed there is depolarization and this depolarization causes influx of the calcium inside the beta cells and this causes exocytosis of insulin granules and release of the insulin. Now, if you ask me how it is, if you see hyperglycemia, glucose is the basic stimulus for the release of insulin from the beta cells. But in diabetes, in spite of having high sugars, these beta cells are not releasing insulin, isn't it? They have failed to release insulin from the beta cells. That is why your sugars are not getting controlled. In normal physiological function, what happens? There is a rise in glucose after a meal. So it is being sensed by the beta cells. It releases insulin and your blood sugars are controlled. But in diabetes, what is happening? In spite of high sugars, these beta cells are not releasing insulin. You understand? So why this sulfonylurea acts and releases insulin? That means beta cells are functioning. They are not functioning in response to the glucose. There is a dysfunction of the beta cells. The beta cell mass is not affected. The beta cell function is affected. There is a dysfunction of the beta cells. So try to understand there is a difference between loss of mass of beta cells, which is there in type 1 diabetes, where in type 2 diabetes there is dysfunction of the beta cells. The same beta cells which is not releasing insulin in response to glucose is releasing insulin in response to sulfonylurea and also in response to things like DPP-4 inhibitors and <coughs> GLP-1 receptor agonist. So we need to understand this that the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity plays a very important role in actually reducing the release of insulin from the beta cells. So the average A1C reduction, if you see, is the best with sulfonylurea. It's the most potent drug. And that is why, see, the most potent drug is insulin. So it causes hypoglycemia. Similarly, the most potent sulfonylurea is, uh, the most potent oral anti-diabetic drug is sulfonylurea. So it causes hypoglycemia. So anything which is uh, potent is going, is likely to cause some bit of hypoglycemia if there is some uh, uh, concern. Completely complementary mechanisms with metformin and both drugs may decrease hepatic glucose overproduction. This is because when you give a self, what is the difference between a sulfonylurea and an insulin, exogenous insulin? Because when you give sulfonylurea, it releases insulin directly into the portal vein and very little insulin is needed to actually inhibit this hepatic glucose production. So sulfonylurea gives a physiological impact as far as uh, hepatic glucose production is concerned, whereas the exogenous insulin doesn't go into the portal vein it goes into the uh, extra uh, hepatic circulation so therefore combination of metformin and sulfonylurea helps in addressing multiple etiologies of hyperglycemia sulfonylurea versus other OIDs as add-on we have excellent data uh, when they have compared glimepiride metformin versus cetagliptin metformin and there was a significant difference as far as uh, HbA1c reduction is concerned there are a lot of studies which we know of CV outcome trials, AMPAREG, 
Cantata, and they all have used sulfonylurea. They have compared with sulfonylurea, Empav with glimepiride, and Canaglis flows in with glimepiride, and they all have been non-inferior to each other. Even lead two study, they have compared liraglutide with versus glimepiride, abliglutide versus glimepiride. Can you believe most of the drugs when they are launching, they compare themselves with sulfonylurea? Why? Because they are the most potent anti-diabetic drugs orally which are available. So you, you, they try to match with them. So sulfonylureas are definitely been head-on compared with most of the drugs which we have. Now this is very much talked about hypoglycemia and weight gain. Now let me tell you, hypoglycemia is very very exaggerated as far as usage of sulfonylurea is concerned. Only when you are not using it correctly, suppose someone is having a hepatic disease, chronic liver disease, someone is having hypoproteinemia. Why hypoproteinemia? Because this drug sulf uh, sulfonylureas are bound to plasma protein. If there is less of protein, more of free drug will be available in the circulation. So you will have more chances of getting hypoglycemia. Similarly, patients having chronic kidney disease or if you are giving some antibiotics or drugs like NSAIDs or uh, drugs like aminoglycosides, they can impair the renal function. There the chances of hypoglycemia is very high. Or there are drug to drug interactions. For example, someone is taking Dapson for Hansen's disease and you prescribe this class of drugs. Someone taking Warfarin for uh, valvular heart disease. So you have to be cautious in prescribing. That doesn't mean this drug causes hypoglycemia. It's like interactions and contraindications which actually precipitates the complications. Even weight gain is mostly very, very exaggerated. Why weight gain is exaggerated? Whenever you have severe hyperglycemia, you get weight loss. Patient will say, Doctor, my 8-10 kilo was not low, then I have sugar check and I was diagnosed with diabetes. So when you start therapy to these individuals, they try to gain a couple of kgs or maybe 4-5 kgs when you start treating them. That is not weight gain. That is like they are recovering from their disease. They are recovering from the dehydration because of hyperglycemia. Weight gain is when the patient was 60 kg before getting diabetes and he becomes 64 kg after uh, starting sulfonylurea. That usually doesn't happen with sulfonylurea therapy. So weight gain is not a big problem and initially there can be a couple of kgs weight gain but after uh, two to three years time when you continue the therapy there is a neutrality of weight. So these are the comparison metformin, glimepiride, glycolazide, glipizide and glimentamide. Hypoglycemia is most common with drugs like glibenclamide. Uh, why glibenclamide? Because the metabolite of even glibenclamide is active. That is the most important thing to understand. And this is the most potent sulfonylurea. The reason is because even the metabolite of glibenclamide is active. The rest of other drugs like glipizide is very, very safe, very short acting, renal friendly uh, sulfonylurea. You can use in patients with stage 3 uh, and stage 4 uh, chronic kidney disease, glycolazide and glipizide. Both of them are short acting uh, sulfonylureas. Even the risk of sulfonylurea versus oral other anti-diabetic drugs, they have compared glycolazide with even cetagliptin is almost the same. Glimipride is weight neutral over 5 years, this is what I was talking, durability and myth of beta cell exhaustion. So this is one area which we need to understand and this has been very very wrongly been marketed by other products which is very very important to understand. I can tell you very simple examples like UKPDS which we are talking about and the other studies. There is a myth that beta cell exhaustion is there with sulfonylurea. They actually compared all the three drugs, metformin, in, even patients were started on insulin in uh, UKPDS study. Even patients who were started on insulin had a gradual decline in the beta cell uh, function. So you can understand it's not sulfonylurea, it's the nature of disease which actually causes decline in the beta cell function. And you start any drug, starting from GLP-1 to semaglutide to any drug, patient need addition of other drug as you follow them up uh, with the progression of disease. So sulfonylureas may correct this imbalance and protect against autophagy associated beta cell death. And lot of patients, the newly diagnosed patients go into something like phase of remission. Doxa, I start, you gave me a very good medicine. I took it for one month and since last five years I have not taken any medicines and my sugars are good. You know, they go into phase of remission even after taking sulfonylurea. You give them 2.5 milligram of glimenclamide and some metformin. They take it for one, one and a half months. Sugars are good and they stop taking it. So you, there are a lot of patients who go into something like phase of remission also. Cardiovascular and renal safety of modern sulfonylurea and the cardiovascular safety started up from UGDP 
the genesis of sulfonylurea CB controversy. They started with tolbutamide uses and they found that almost 70% of the uh, patients on tolbutamide had higher chance of getting CAD compared to the placebo group. But later on they found that the study design which was done for tolbutamide was grossly uh, uh, with lot of mistakes and they uh, uh, could not fight it back. I don't know how many know about tolbutamide. Tolbutamide was marketed by Hex by the name of Restinon, 0.5 gram and 1 gram. And then came the uh, chlorpropamide, which was again marketed by Pfizer with the name of Dibenes. A lot of us have used in, uh, when we were in Raheja, we used to use uh, this class of drugs. But hypoglycemia, hypertension and electrolyte imbalance was a real big concern. UKPDS started up with chlorpropamide, then they switched over to glibenclamide later on because of the complications. Then we had glibenclamide is a commonly known as with dionyl. The micronized glimenclamide used to have less of complications compared to the conventional one. Then we had glipizide. I'll take two, three uh, more minutes, two, three more minutes. So this is how they have evolved. Then we have glimepiride. You know, glimepiride is there uh, when we were doing post gyation. That was in 1997, 98. We used to get in the OPD from the uh, Sanofi people to use in our uh, clinical uh, OPDs. So you can understand the experience which we have with drugs like glibenclamide and glycolazide. So we have a lot of data as far as CV safety is concerned and this is a very, very good meta-analysis which suggests that glycolazide and glimepiride were associated with a lower risk of all cause and cardiovascular related mortality compared with glibenclamide. And this is what I was talking about, the long-term effects of sulfonylureas on macrovascular outcomes. So you have benefits everywhere with sulfonylureas. It's just we need to understand uh, the science behind it and use it very, very uh, rationally. And the modern sulfonylureas like glimepiride is CV safe. Almost all these CV outcome trials have used this. The Carolina study, they compared with glimepiride thinking they will have a very good data, but it was non-inferior. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, Lena Glipton. So even uh, the uh, CV outcome trials, you will see that the uh, uh, glimepiride was non-inferior to uh, Lena Glipton in this Carolina study. Even the advanced study is a very landmark study which used glycolazide and they used in people who were 10 years old diabetic and they had a poor control for last 10 years. So you can understand the very, very high risk population they did this study and they found that the PEP reduced by 10% and microvascular events by 21% and macrovascular events by 6% and that also the renal outcome was pretty decent because they also used perindropyl as an ACE inhibitor in the active arm. So CV outcome, these are the data which we have talked about, different sulfonylureas and renal outcome. Today even a sulfonylurea like glycolazide has been recommended to be safely used in patients with kidney disease in all stages, less chances of hypoglycemia. And if you see the guidelines by almost everyone, whether it is ADA, RSS, DI, WHO, IDF, all recommend the use of sulfonylurea. Even the South Asian consensus which was done have recommended the use of modern sulfonylureas. There are three modern sulfonylureas, glimepiride, extended release glycolazide, and glipizide extended uh, uh, release. So all three of them can be very safely used in most of our patients. This, and, uh, this is how you can use, uh, use alone or in combination with metformin. Let me tell you, a lo lot of people get GI side effects with metformin. So you can stop their metformin and try on a very small dose of sulfonylurea. And sulfonylurea are the most GI friendly. Even cetagliptin have got a lot of GI side effects. They even uh, raises uh, lipase and amylase enzymes in few patients and can cause uh, G, uh, GI side effects. So you can try this drug as a monotherapy and you can see whether it is drug induced or it is some uh, uh, other cause behind it. Ischemic preconditioning and sulfonylurea is another a big concern. Uh, what is ischemic preconditioning? that in normal individual, what happens is whenever there are phases of ischemia in the coronary arteries, there is opening up of the potassium channel so that the entry of the calcium channel is not there. And that causes immediate vasodilatation and correction of the ischemia. But the uh, sulfonylurea receptors are also present in the coronary arteries, the smooth muscles. And, uh, and what they have found that if uh, these uh, potassium channels are closed by uh, sulfonylureas, the ischemic preconditioning is getting uh, impaired and the patients can have prolonged ischemia and cause further damage to the myocardium. So this is not been seen with the modern sulfonylureas like glycolazide and glimepiride. Why? Because glimepiride has got three to 
six times rapid association when compared to glimepiride at the sulfonylurea receptors and the dissociation is still faster by eight times. So you can understand at the level of receptors they don't bind for pretty long time. So who recommends sulfonylurea as a second line treatment of type 2 diabetes? Even uh, we are using the same way. Uh, ADA even choosing oral anti-diabetic drug if cost is a major issue. Let me tell you in spite of cost, the availability of sulfonylurea is there in each and every corner of the country. In the smallest of the villages in the rural area, you can get a sulfonylurea metformin, but not the other drugs. So you should always try to choose a drug which patients can take easily. Unlike West, finance is a big concern. So to summarize this, early glycemic control can help minimize the risk of chronic exposure to hyperglycemia and complications of diabetes. And we have data from UKPDS, patients who were on sulfonylurea, there was almost 40 to 45 percent reduction in uh, microvascular risk. The complications were reduced remarkably, all the microvascular complications. And evidence suggests that monotherapy or combination therapy is the backbone of type 2 diabetes treatment and the use of modern sulfonylurea in combination with basal insulin can decrease the dose of basal insulin. And the Indian diabetes needs an Indian solution. Very interesting four uh, A's, appropriate, available, affordable and accessible. All three are very, very important for our country. And this is the takeaway message, final slide. Newer sulfonylureas are associated with lower risk of all cause and cardiovascular related mortality. Newer sulfonylureas are associated with a lower risk of CAD. Modern sulfonylureas should be used over conventional sulfonylureas in the management of type 2 diabetes. And in addition to glycemic control, sulfonylureas poses a variety of pleiotropic effects, the extra pancreatic benefits, and considering better glycemic efficacy, long term safety, and low medication cost, sulfonylureas should be continued to be used as a frontline front agent. Thank you all for your patient listening.